said you might be growing, like I gave you the example of the iris that I have, that it's a perennial, even though I don't see it during the winter because it dies back, right? It's still perennial. Just because it, it, you know, it only sprouts once a year doesn't make it an annual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so, oh, but just to kind of let you know, I did want to print this up. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, you notice I have germination or sprouting. Does anybody know what the difference is? When I talk about that? Germination yeah. that's starting from seed because yeah. all perennials have to start somewhere. Right. And sprouting is when it's just re coming up. Oh, yeah, so, so in this case, yeah, so germination is always from a seed, whereas sprouting is from a vegetative organ. Okay, so it could be a rhizome, tuber, bulb, et cetera. Okay? So that's why I just wanted to make that clear. I'm, I'm a little bit over, over cautious about terminology. I'm kind of <laughs> a geek about that. So, uh, so that's why I always put that out. But as, as you know, someone pointed out, it's like it has to start somewhere and it's chicken or egg, right? So, so you know, sometimes they start with a seed. And once they start by seed, and then they get the perennial organs, though, then they maintain themselves as, as a perennial. Okay, but they can't have seeds. Just want to point that out. So the plant, after it, it germinates or sprouts, then it, it grows. And in this case, let's just consider the sprouting. So it grows, and as it grows, it produces new stolons or new tubers or whatever the vegetative organ is, right? But where that comes from, Okay. Most of the time, it has to come up from a vegetative part. So, has anybody here ever grown um, a potato from, you know, like one of those science things? Yeah. So, you, you grow, you take like that potato seed piece, or they call it bad terminology because it is a vegetative portion. And you notice as the potato grows that that initial part gets all shriveled up, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then it puts out roots and, and, and rhizomes, and then those rhizomes terminate into new potatoes, and those potatoes eventually get all plump and everything, right? So that's, that's the way it works. <clears throat> so in this case, this is very similar to that. So the initial growth comes out of that, that perennial part. And so it's taking all of its, its energy out of there. So it's being sucked out of that perennial piece. <clears throat> so, so that is when, at some point during that, there's a balance between when it has the lowest amount of stored carbohydrates, right? And, and before it starts really making new carbohydrates to push into the new perennial parts, okay? So, so at one point, there's going to be a low amount of stored carbohydrates in that initial piece. Okay? Um, then it could flower to pop be pollinated, just like the annuals, though, um, and the seeds be set. But, but here is where, you know, again, just think about potatoes. This is where all the, the photosynthates are being pushed into those new vegetative organs, okay? So now you've got a lot of carbohydrates in the, in the organs, right? And then that's when we've got the highest amount of stored carbohydrates. And then we get, so let's knock out the germination, and then we get back to the next season. Now we're all ready to sprout again, right? Get, get, you can see that, right, without me drawing it out. Okay, so for a perennial type plant, when's the best time to control that? Given the lowest amount of carbohydrates. Right, okay. And does anybody want to say why that is? It's at its weakest point. Right, okay. So... You, and, and many times it's also, some, it, sometimes, well, sometimes it's earlier in the season. You know, again, you have to kind of watch when it comes up. And for me, the best way to control these things is, is when you see it start to come up, whatever perennial weed is, you, you remove that, that sprout, okay, whatever comes up. Then what typically happens is that that's, that's usually the strongest sprout. So that one comes up. You take, you remove that, and what happens is that now that bud, because rhizomes and stolons and all those things, they're really compressed stems, and stems have buds on them. So there's, there's probably more than one bud on, on that vegetative organ. But those next buds, all right, so let me, let me go back. So let's say you have a tree, okay. and, and the tree is a, just a stick, right, it's a sapling. And then, so if you don't prune it, what happens? It just, it just grows up. If you cut off the top, what happens? Yeah. It sprouts, right? So what's that called? You might know. Ap apical dominance. Okay? There's, there's, there's a hormone okay, that suppresses all the lateral buds. And so if you cut off, and that's all in the top bud, but if you remove that, that releases the, the 
competing hormones that allows for size sprouting. Okay, that's like when you pinch your um, moms and things like that. That's what you, what you want to do. You're taking out that, that bud, you, get, you lose apical dominance. <clears throat> so it's the same thing with all these perennial type, type organs, is that if you cut off the main stem, okay, which is the first bud, you're going to get sprouting from the other ones. Which is good because all the other ones aren't going to be as strong as that first one. So that first one will come up. Okay, that's taking most of the energy that's in that that organ. Okay, you take that out. Now there's not as much carbohydrates left for the other buds when they sprout. And so typically what happens is one or two of them will sprout. Go ahead, remove them as they come up. And now you probably don't have as many good buds in there. So what we're trying to and that's with perennials, you typically have to do this a few times. It's not a one-time thing. So that's why perennials are so hard to control, is because they still have a lot of stored, stored energy and a lot of buds that could be available for sprouting. But typically, like, like for nutsedge, it has one good one, and then if, if you control that one, number two and number three will come up, but they're going to be very much weaker. Generally, if you can pull those out, you know, the first three out, you're not going to have a nutsedge problem after that. But you've got to be really fast. Right? You wait very long, it will produce new ones. Um, okay, so, so yes, okay, do it at the time of the lowest stored carbohydrates. Now, someone brought out the, the fact about the Bermuda buttercup, which is a perennial um, type of oxalis. And she said, well, she had heard that the best time to do that is when it flowers. And in some cases, so many cases, it's early in the season, it's first starting to sprout, which is good. <laughs> so you can do it that way. Sometimes it's recommended that you wait till it flowers because in that case, that's when they're also pushing a lot of carbohydrates out. Okay. Um, but that's best if you're going to, not so much if you're pulling it up, but that's best if you are going to be applying a translocated herbicide, like, like glyphosate. Okay. Because then it's taking up a lot of the, um, will take up a lot of the herbicide and move it to the perennial organ. Okay. So if you're pulling it, try and do it early in the season, if you're applying a a translocated herbicide to control the perennial weed, then you might want to think about doing it when it's flowering. Okay? How's that? Y'all good? Okay. All right. So perennials are harder. Okay. So this is the yellow nutsedge. So if you have not seen it, you really need to acquaint yourself with it because it's a really bad weed and, and it's best controlled as soon as you see it. Okay? So you might start seeing, seeing it sprout about now probably started sprouting actually about a month ago, but you probably start noticing it now. The problem is, this is the, the flower head, it's where the seeds are. Yellow nut sedge has about 17% germination, so it's very low gem germination. Most of the spread is actually due to the tubers. So here's the tubers. Um, it, they come from rhizomes, so the rhizome terminates in a tuber. This, this, this is an immature one, okay? and it's not life size. All right, just want to make that clear. <laughs> Some people might, might feel that way. They're about the size of a, of a pea, I would say, um, like the regular garden pea, uh, typically. And they, in what, when they're mature, they're dark brown and, and smooth on the surface. So, so the, the rhizome will terminate either in a, in a tuber with yellow nut sedge, or it might make another plant. So it might, could come up. So they tend to kind of spread in a circle. <clears throat> and there's another one. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's another kind of nut sedge called purple nut sedge. And they're kind of hard to tell the difference unless you're really in tune to it when, they, when they're just leaves. The flowers, see how these are yellow? The flower for purple nut sedge are a little bit browner or reddish. But you don't really you shouldn't wait till the flowers. The, the beauty of purple nut sedge is that the seeds have almost zero germination. Okay? They're, very, they're, they're not viable at all. Very little impact on the spread. But the tubers, remember I said that for yellow nut sedge, the tubers will just terminate in a, in a, in a tuber okay, or another plant. For purple nut sedge, it'll have a tuber, and then a tuber will spray out the same season, and then make another tuber, and then make another tuber, and make another tuber. So remember that book I said about the world's worst weeds? Yeah. Okay, the number one bestseller in the... <laughs> Bot Botany Geek Library. So that's actually, purple nuts is actually the number one weed. Oh, okay. Those are edible too. <clears throat> so if you wanted to put it in a container, that would be the one instead of the yellow? Absolutely not. 
And the reason I say that is because <laughs> see, he isn't edible. And that's a really good point. Is that purple nut sedge tastes? I've, I've eaten it. It tastes terrible. Absolutely terrible. It's like it's like you had taken um, almonds. Let me put it this way. And, and soaked them in some kind of really bad cologne. <laughs> and that, for some reason, that's what it kind of, yeah, right. But yellow, you can do that. And actually, you know, it's, if it's, you plant yellow and you put it in a container and, it, and the container gets really full, it, the tubers actually get bigger. You know, they, they tend to be, you'll, you'll find them around the edge of the container so you can pop them out, you know, click, take off the big tubers and then put it back in. And keep you going. just the flowers off if you don't want it spreading anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're so inclined. But they're actually, you know, if you're actually interested in growing it, you might want to look into getting the, the, the Chufa variety. Yeah, C-H-U-F-A. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so just, just an example of a perennial. Okay. Okay, so then, so we're going to still talking about weed classification. Just want to, <coughs> thank you. So somebody... So it, a lot of times for control, you might be reading on a, on a label of a pesticide or herb, herbicide, and that they'll say it controls broadleaf weeds and grasses, or conter, can, controls grassy weeds in landscapes or something like that. And so when they say broadleaf, they mean dicots. So I just want to be clear because a lot of times they're, they're not specific when they are talking about it. You say, well, it's broadleaf. You know, I've got this, this grass and it's got a really big broadleaf. And so I can use it to control that, and that's not the case. So broadleaf are always the, the dicots, and you know, as you know, they've got the netted leaf, and, and has true two true seed leaves, and they come up as opposed to the. Sometimes they'll say narrow leaf. When they say narrow leaf, though, when you're looking at the herbicide container, they almost exclusively need grasses. Okay? The other monocots are sedges and rushes. Rushes like that nut sedge is a is a true sedge. And so sometimes people call it nut grass, right? You might have heard that. I hate that because it's very confusing because people think, oh, what's well, a grass, right? But it's not. And so if you get something that is made to control grass and you say, oh, I've got nut grass, it's, it's terrible because you're introducing a pesticide into the environment that's not going to work on that plant because you think it's a, it's a grass and it's actually a sedge. Okay? So, but just the botanical term, you know, they're, they're all monocots. So you really need to know, you know whether it's a grass or a sedge. And so. And I guess this is a good time to say it, just kind of bring this up. So there, there's a few good things you can use to identify the weeds. This, in addition to that weed wheel, which is just incredible. Okay, right. Um, this is a, yeah? I'm sorry. Um, okay. Did I miss it? I could have missed it. What's a rush? Oh, so a rush is, is um, like cattails, bull rush, bull rush. It's a juncus, juncus species, it's usually. Sometimes there's, um, there's probably some planet out there. Out, in the there, yeah, you know, so it's a good or, ornamental type type plants in many cases. Um, sometimes they you find a lot. Well, there's some that grow well in dry situations. Some most of them grow better in moist situations. So you find them like, um, like if you've got sort of a, a, a like a little pond or something like that, and put them because they will some of them will grow in the water. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, so so the book. So this is a really these are both. This is one thing. Okay, this is volume one, volume two, and they come, they sell them together. Um, oh, good. I know. Wow. Isn't that incredible? I use this to work out. I just like walk around, you know. And then if I happen to see something, I go, oh, okay. No. <laughs> so, so this it doesn't have anything about control, but it's it's got something like seven hundred pictures. And when you buy it, it actually comes with a CD that has just the pictures on it. So it's really great for somebody like, like me that's never taken a taxonomy class. So it's, it's really hard for me to sort of do this keying out, like, oh, it's got this many particles and this and labels and all that kind of stuff. So typically when I am trying to identify something, I, do, I use something called a leaf method. method. You know, so, so essentially that's what it is. You just leaf through the book. You can find, <laughs> you can find something that looks like it. Okay. So, so the electronic version of that is I put the CD in my laptop and I just, you know, just fit forward, 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 forward. So I, you know, and you can imagine it takes a long time because there are 700 pictures. But, but um, you can kind of go through it pretty fast. <clears throat> so, anyway, so this is a really good book. It's Weeds of California and other Western states. And it's, the, the beauty of it is that it's got so many pictures in it. 
okay? And, and not just a picture of the mature plant, but also the seedling and many times the seeds. And, and so, I mean, just look, look at one thing. The flowers, I'm sure you can't see it, but, you know, come take a look at it sometime when you can. So, so this is a really good book. Um, Who's the author? Jody Tomaso. This is a UC cooperative, it's a UC A&R publication, so I, go ahead, Scott. So you can get 40% off the price. <laughs> yeah, so it's probably, it's a, so it'll probably be about 50 bucks. Okay, I think. Sometimes it goes to sale and you can get it cheaper. So, so that's, that's with your, with your discount. And then there's another book, if you don't want to, see this one's really good because it has most of the weeds across California including turf weeds and so forth, and, which a lot of times many people neglect. So, so here's another book called Weeds of the West, which is, this one's much cheaper, it's like $25, something like that. Oh, I should, I'll tell you a funny story about this in a second. But, um, so this is about $25, something like that. And then this also has really good pictures, description of the plants, um, it's, it's quite good. But it focuses a lot on rangeland weeds and crop weed because it's like everything pretty much from Kansas on west. Okay, so so I find that many. I mean, it's got a lot that we have here, but it doesn't have as many as this one does. Okay. So okay, so just a quick funny thing that happened here. So this book, the guy that the main author of this, Jody Tommaso, asked me to review some of the weeds before the the book came out. Just you know, something we typically do, we'll re review each other's stuff, just to make sure that it's accurate and no mistakes that, you know, after you read this, you know, ten times, you're, you're not, you know, as an author, you, you might be missing something, right? So you want some extra eyes on it. So he, you, know, you can imagine, this was like a five-year labor of love for this guy. So he, he asked me to review it, and I did that, and then he said that even after he finished the book with all the pictures and everything, he went through it again and fixed a lot of the pictures because by the time, because he had learned a lot along the way, and the pictures at the end were actually, you know, he used Photoshop and all that kind of stuff to make them look really good. So the pictures at the end are much better than the pictures at the beginning. So he went back and did the picture at the beginning again. I mean, he just like went through it and everything's meticulous in this. And so the book came out. Let me see if it's in here. And um, so my name is Cheryl Willen, okay, and it's spelled W-I-L-E-N. And then, let's see which volume is this. And so, every time, you know, just like when we used to get phone books, the first thing you would do is go look and see if your name's in there. So, <laughs> so I did that with this, because I wanted to see if, if he kind of gave me a little bit of credit. So here is in the acknowledgments. And I'm going to see. Hang on. Hang on. Oh. You've got like a whole page of it. There you are. Okay. So yeah, so I'm in here. And he's so remember my name is W Y O E N and he, one of the acknowledgments is Dr. Cheryl Willens. And he went through this whole thing like five times and you know, that's the mistake he makes. <laughs> And then there's the, the weed gallery. Okay. 
And so part of it is you can identify, if you're not even sure if it's a, a grass or a sedge or a broadleaf, this will actually help you um, identify that. So you can go through like this this broadleaf tutorial, okay? So it kind of talks about that a little bit. But um, but let's go go back to okay. So you you know the plants of broadleaf, for example. So what you can do, you just click on this picture, and then these are actual pictures of plants. I mean, but but don't look at the actual plant. This is just to. To, to just kind of give you examples when they say, is it spreading? Is it, does it have a rosette? Does it have world leaves? Or maybe you're looking at the leaf. So, so what you do, you just find something that, that looks like what you have. This isn't really a key. It's more like a um, sort of an elimination of things. So like here's one. Remember I said clovers and um, oxalis look very similar? These people confuse them. So here you say, well, I don't know. It looks, I, I can see it's got this, this three leaflet shape. So let me just click on that. And then here's all the pictures that come up that look like plants that have that kind of leaflet that's in our database. You know, there's probably other ones, but there's the ones that are in our database. And then what you can do is if you just mouse over it, you get bigger pictures. Okay. And so I'm just going to go like that. So you get, you get a better idea, a little close up. And you say, oh, you know what, this kind of looks like what I, what I have. So then you can actually click on that. And then it brings you up to this bigger section, and then it has some descriptions about it. And then if you say, I, you know what, I really want to see it a little bit closer, you can actually click on each one of these individual squares, okay? And that'll bring you up an even bigger picture of it, okay? So, so that's one, one tool that you can use for identifying. The other one, again, we, we will go through this later. It's, it's called the Weed Research Information Center, and that's shortened as... Look, you guys. Hi. <laughs> we'll do this later. Don't, don't, don't try and mess with it right now. Okay. Because I'm going too fast for you to kind of follow on that one. But, but the other one is the Weed Research Information Center, so that's abbreviated WRIC, or WRIC. Okay. And then... This you actually have to go through a couple steps to get to the weed ID section, but it's over here the weed ID tool. And so first you have to go there, and then you've got to actually do it again here. So we, and in this case, again, this is why it's important that if you need to know whether it's a broadleaf or a grass or something like that. In this case, they just say grass like, okay? So that would include the sedges and the rushes in addition to the grasses. And on the side, it kind of gives you a little bit of information to help you decide what it is. So, so for example, you know the plants a broadly, then you can go to step two, you just click on that, and it gives you a bunch of other choices, like where it was found, um, what's its growth form, say, so let's just do that. Because let's say somebody brings you in a plant and just leaves it on your desk, you know, in the office. So you don't know where it came from, you know it came from somebody's farm, you don't know if it came from a golf course or anything. So so you can just leave that empty if you like. But but you can kind of tell from it, you know, whether it's growing upright or whether it's growing prostrate or whether it's creeping and so forth. You can kind of tell some of that. But if you don't, you can just leave it leave it blank. But just for the heck of it, I'll I'll pick one that's prostrate. And if you're not sure what that means, see the question mark at each side? If you just click on that, it'll give you some examples. Um, some pictures and say, well, okay, this is what we mean by upright, this is what we mean by creeping or binding, and so forth. Okay? So then you can just go from there. And then, again, you just pick the things that you know. If you don't know, you just leave it blank, and then it'll allow you to search the, the database. So just for the heck of it, I'm just going to pick two things because I know this will make it short. Um, so I picked something that was, was prostrate, um, has milky sap, I'm going to say it does not have tendrils, and say it's an annual. Okay? And that's all I've said. I don't know anything about leaf hairs. I didn't look at the petioles. I didn't check the stem, and so forth. So let's see what comes up when we go check, check the database. And what comes up is are the spurges. Okay? So it'll be like spotted spurge. Oh, we'll see some outside. So that's just an example. And then you can click on that and give you a little bit of a picture, close up again. So you can say, oh, yeah, that's what I have. That's what I have. 
<laughs> well, that's not what I have. Okay, so that's that's just another one that. Um, and, and like I said, this afternoon we'll we'll work through some of these. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So as I said, one of the main things is to identify what you have. Because if you're not able to identify what it is, you can't really know how to, how to control it. You know, just like when you go to the doctor, you, know, you say, I've got a sore throat. The doctor, well, I guess now, here, they just say, take this. And but, but, you know, a good MD should say, okay, well, we'll take a culture to see what it is. And even now they say, we're going to take a culture to see whether it's the resistant strain of what it is, in case we have to give you something else. So, so they typically, or they probably should not, just, just hand you an antibiotic for, for a sore throat. Okay, so that's the first thing is identify what the problem is. And then, of course, the life cycle, because, again, remember that what I told you about crabgrass? I said, if you know it's an annual and you know it's at the end of its season and somebody says, I've got all this crabgrass, I just noticed it, and, and here it is October, what should I do about it? You should be able to look in one of these books, or at least through, through your own knowledge or the pest notes, and say, oh, well, it's at the end of the cycle. I want to tell this person that called me or showed me this plant that they shouldn't do anything about it. Um, okay. All right, so and then the other thing is, is, is how are you going to, to manage it? So I'm sure that when uh, Dr. Flint was here, she talked a lot about this for the integrated pest management class. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, okay. So, so as part of the integrated pest management program, you always want to mix up you know, what ways you're going to be doing to manage the, whatever the problem is. And so for weeds, we have the same type of uh, processes that any other kind of pest you would have. We're a little bit light on biological control of weeds, unless you count like goats or something like that. <laughs> but, um, but there are a few. Yeah. Um, but so, so let's just, just talk about this a little bit. Okay. Oh, I guess I have a <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit. Of, well, let's, let's go back actually. To make, let's talk about prevention. Okay, so how would you prevent weeds from, from becoming a problem? Okay, not, no, I mean, even before they get, get to your site. <laughs> What's that? Well, okay, let's, all right, I'll go even back, back farther. Um, let's say you're at a nursery, and you see a five-gallon pot of a plant you really love. But that pot seems like it's coming with a very cool brown cover. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what? What'd you do? Okay, so so I hear weed it at the nursery. I hear somebody say pass. Um, so yeah, so I actually, depending on how heavy it is, I would probably pass on that. And the, the reason is is that even though you might be taking out the weeds that might be on the surface, because remember the seed bank. Okay, so what you see is not always what you get. There's probably a lot more seeds in, it, in there. So. If you are in love with that plant, you know, and you can't remove the seeds, you would have to do something. So that's not preventative, right? You'd have to bring it back, and then you can put mulch down around it and hopefully suppress the weeds that might be coming up. But, um, but you know, to be truly preventative, you would not be bringing new weed seeds into your garden yourself. Okay. Um, so any other examples of something like that? You know what? All right, what about, okay, go on. Like a pre-emergent? Well, I mean, it's of, of a preventative type before you even. Okay, so okay. Bringing in topsoil. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so so what he's saying is that. Well, I don't know. Do you want to describe? It? I don't know what's in your mind. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you uh, if you're going to buy topsoil, you want to know how it was treated before you bring it to your property, because it might be full of all kinds of weed seed at that point. Mm -hmm. You want to find out how the how the uh, soil was prepared before you decide you're going to buy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so typically topsoil, the only thing that I'll ever do to topsoil, so he's, like let's say you are trying to, um, you probably wouldn't bring topsoil in for a garden, but well, let's say you're trying to fill in like a yard that has some divots and things like that, through whatever reason that happened over time. I find that like in, in ball fields, you know, they just play so hard that there's like little rolling places. So what, uh, 
the managers will do, they'll bring in truckloads of topsoil and just fill it in, right? So topsoil, typically the only thing that's ever done to it is not, so, it's not um, composted or anything like that. Sometimes it's screened, okay? So just to kind of like get big things out. And, and if you're lucky, they screen it small enough to get like nuts edge tubers, but, but probably not. It's usually just for rocks and so forth because it's, you know, just where they haul it out when they're building the best subdivision. So, so in that case, many times there, there are numerous weeds in that situation. And in fact, that, that when you brought that up, that's a, that reminded me of this case when I was working with a, uh, a park in Anaheim where they, they said, oh, you know what, we have all these, we didn't have these, this problem before, but you know, now we have it. We have all these, uh, it's another kind of sedge they had in, their, in the um, park. And I said, we've never had it before. I don't know what happened, but, but we have a lot now. And I said, well, you know, have you ever done, have you done anything over the past year that's, that's different? And they said, well, you know, my boss got this great deal on topsoil. Okay. <laughs> and we brought in about five truckloads of it and, and put it down. And I said, well, you know, that's probably the problem is that the topsoil was contaminated with those weed seeds and now you have this, this issue. So, so be careful. So that's, that's an idea. So you need to know that if you're buying topsoil, they, they should, you know, not use no music your garden or say, you know, you need to guarantee to me that it's, it's low weeds or weed free. Yeah. Um, are there any companies that you know of that um, you can buy a bag of potting soil or, or planting weeds where it actually will say on the bag that they've done things to try to eradicate the right. seeds? Right. Yeah. So typically, the ones that are, it, it's like a compost mix. Okay, or, or or they'll say soil soilless media are, are generally weed free because when they when they're soilless, that means that there's no actual mineral soil in there. So it'd be like a mixture of compost and maybe peat moss and um, maybe perlite and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's no since there's no soil, there's nothing that the weeds. But when you buy a bag of potting right. soil, you know, E.B. Stone, any of those big companies, right. I find that no matter what I do, I always get a crop of weeds. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it, 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 it's interesting to me that you said that because they should be weed free. I mean, typically, and if, if they aren't, then you, know, you should go back to them and say, look, you know, I planted this and, you know, get, especially in a pot because, you know, you're not bringing anything in. Um, but I bought a, a bag of commercial potting mix for, for my own research and I planted it out in four inch pots and probably like 500 four inch pots. and. A weed that I have never seen before came up. <laughs> okay, so I, I and I know it's it's what from this potting mix. So I'm not sure if it's sort of an industry-wide issue now or, or what. But did um, you get a good deal? <laughs> 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 it was cheap. Yeah. yeah, luckily they were easy to pull up. But uh, yeah, no, it's very. It's, I've never had a problem with them with that that brand before. So it was an interesting situation. But um, yeah, I mean, they, there are standards. I have to say. I mean, there, I mean, there are actual standards for you know percent weeds and because when they sell in these commercial places, when they sell them, they actually take samples, you know, on the ongoing process and grow them out to see what's what's in there.